Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our third webinar. Um, I'm Patty George. I'm a PH pulmonologist, Team PH athlete, and co-founder of Team Phenomenal Hope. Um, really appreciate you joining us for our third and final live session for PH Awareness Month. Um, I'll be super excited to introduce our outstanding guest speaker today. But before I do, I want to talk to you a little bit about Team Phenomenal Hope and one of our special programs. Each week, these uh, webinars have been sponsored by our programs. And so uh, this week, our, our program is sponsored by our Phenomenal Impact Research Award program, where Team Phenomenal Hope has funded a rigorous international grant program and already has funded two research awards in the past two years. These are funds that have been raised through patients and events and donations, et cetera, that go directly to promising researchers so they can generate um, exciting data and hopefully help make a difference in this disease. We're excited by the work that has been done by Dr. Vinny Agrawal from Vanderbilt University, who was the 2019 recipient, and from this year's re recipient, Paula Menezes. Can't wait to see what she has uh, in store for, through her research work. Our application window will open again soon in the new year, and you can learn more about our research program and also everything that we're doing in Team Phenomenal Hope, but during this awareness month and also throughout the year at our website, teamphenomenalhope.org. So today's program is a topic that's very important to all members of the PH community. And I'm honored to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Jean-Luc Vachiri. He's a PH cardiologist at Erasmus Academic Hospital in Brussels. And he's also father of two children, one grandchild, a huge fan of football, soccer, beer, chocolate, rugby, um, and just a great individual. I'm so excited to hear him talk to us today about research breakthroughs and where we're headed. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jean-Luc. Hey, thank you very much, Patty. That's a very, very nice and kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm really excited to be uh, to be with you today. Here it's uh, it's 5 p.m. Uh, it's getting to be time for the first round of drinks for the aperitif, which is why we we created a new acronym for a new endpoint in a clinical trial, which is the TTFB, the time to first beer, which is getting close now <laughs> here in the uh, over here in, 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 in Belgium. So um, I would like to, to, to share with you a couple of things. I'm sharing my screen now um, with you guys. Uh, and, and again, Patty, thanks to you, but also to, to all the, the, the whole team of Team Phenomenal Hope. It, it's extremely impressive the work you're doing for, for, for patients and, and, their, and their caregivers. I think this is one of the things I've learned over the past uh, past 20 years I'm involved in this field, which is that the best we can do for our patients is to be supportive and to be transparent in our activities. So this is pretty much what I'm going to try to do in the next 25 to 30 minutes. Um, share with you a couple of thoughts on progresses and problems in the management of pH, where we are and where are we heading at? Uh, I think um, it's important for uh, people, for folks who are listening to this to know that I ha have some financial disclosures that can be seen here on this screen with most of the companies who have a, a drug for pulmonary hypertension. We're also supported by Actelian uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, as um, a research grant recipient at my hospital. So let's start with um, something we know very well uh, in the pH community and you as patients and caregivers may also know, these are the guidelines for the management of pH. We started with complete void. Um, th that was in the uh, uh, previous century, in the 20th century, there was no guidelines, there was no uh, uh, therapies for pH to now something that um, has been written in many international guidelines, and I'm taking here the example of uh, the European uh, guidelines, the European Respiratory Society and Society of Cardiology. We, we came from nothing, pretty much, to a, and we progressively evolved to a situation where we now have therapies for uh, patients right at the time of diagnosis. So when I started my small career in the field, we were using 
apoprostenol as a bridge to transplant. And now we have therapies that we use in combination uh, immediately when we have a proper diagnosis and we perform escalation of treatment, et cetera, things that many of the uh, uh, healthcare professionals know very well to bring patients to the best level possible in terms of quality of life symptoms and of course, decrease of, uh, of events. Of course, this didn't came overnight. Um, it's uh, a, a, an important breakthrough in our understanding of the disease and many progresses that were made in, the, uh, uh, in other areas, not just uh, treatment by itself. A, it's always interesting when you're treating people with a rare disease to look at what's happening in other chronic disorders, uh, as bad as pH. And I would like to put forward to you the HIV example. Everything that was done in the HIV uh, area um, was driven by very important progresses and breakthrough, treatments, diagnosis, and pathogenetic. And this is where, uh, what, how, sorry, our, our colleagues in the HIV world move from monotherapy survival trials to long-term durability trial using combination strategies that uh, it is something that we are doing in PH. This is something we do. We have established therapies as background standard of care, and now we're doing combination strategy trials. And you can, in fact, take this slide and flip it to pulmonary arterial hypertension. First breakthrough, IV poprastinol. We used the echocardiography that was the real diagnostic bridge breakthrough and the time we had the first randomized control trials. And now we're moving to a better understanding of endothelial dysfunction, uh, genetic aspects. So it's the how the disease really evolves in the pulmonary vessels uh, with all combination therapy. And we're awaiting long-term durability trials with the new compound. What we have today, Three classes of drugs, sequential and initial combination. There's a treatment for all patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. And this is where we stand today in terms of treatment recommendations. Now, what I would like to, 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 to drive you through in the next couple of minutes is what we've achieved. So the road to the current treatment strategy, how we get there, because many people forget where we're coming from. This is something we discuss a lot with our patients, which is that what, 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 what is prescribed today has been built on very strong, very important research. Where we are, recent frustrations, but we have some hope. And where we go and how we try to address the challenges, there will be an imbalance with each of these, each of these blocks, but uh, believe me, we're going to cover all, all of them. So so it's the evolving landscape of pH management I would like to review with you. Um, let's start with this. Um, what we do when we write guidelines or when we establish treatment strategy is that we base our decisions, we base our recommendation on science. And this is what you can read here on this slide. You see different colors, different acronyms. This is something that became quite popular at the verge of the years 2000 and now is quite consistent with little clinical trials. We try to find fancy acronyms. What is important to know is that we have achieved 41 trials with close to 10,000 patients with various etiologies uh, of pulmonary arterial hypertension. I do not know any other rare disease that uh, was able to uh, finalize such important achievements. There's, there's none actually. Um, so this is quite unique in the field of pulmonary hypertension in the field of rare disease to have so many randomized control trials to establish our uh, treatment strategy uh, strategies. With the asterisks here, you see approval studies. Approval studies means that we, we had drugs that were brought in the market because this intervention with that specific drug was proven to be effective on an outcome or a, a, what we call an endpoint, which is one specific target. It can be walking distance, it can be hemodynamics, it can be anything else. But those studies were performed to bring drug to the market. One of the big change we've seen over the past years is that there was some sort of uh, I would say pulmonary hypertension has been the sleepy giant, the sleeping giant, because we've been moving from drugs to the market to something that is different. And one of the drivers of this difference is the change of the criteria 
to judge success and to measure efficacy in the trials. We've been using walking distance. Walking distance is great. It's testing the patient's capacity to uh, carry on, I would say, normal activities or, or, or non-maximal activities. It's very sensitive to changes, and it has been absolute instrumental to bring new therapies to the market. We realized that at some point, especially when you have background treatment, this test sorry, might not be as sensitive as it was to detect changes. And this is why we started looking at endpoints like clinical worsening, time to clinical worsening, morbid mortality. Very simply, it's mortality, it's rate of hospitalization or rate of disease progression, whatever the weight was measured. So clearly a movement from one biomarker which is six minute walking distance to something that is much more subtle and probably on the long term confirming the efficacy of what we're doing uh, on the long run, not only by just testing mod uh, small modifications in, the, um, 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 in, 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 in an endpoint, in general endpoint, such as walking distance. So exercise capacity to event-driven trials. I spare you the details of those trials because um, they're not that important to detail for this discussion today, but I'm, I'm very happy to go in deeper um, and in deep in, in some of the aspects. What I just, want, just wanted to, to show you is this, is the consensus algorithm for pulmonary arterial hypertension that was discussed at the last World Symposium on Pulmonary Hypertension in Nice, and that has been published in a very uh, important journal um, um, uh, where most of the studies we're doing is published, at least one of the important journals. What you need to understand is once the diagnosis is made, um, the patients who are in the most severe state or most severe stage of the disease with markers of severity go on very aggressive treatment that may include a parenteral prostacycline, which is what we would recommend at least at our center in many centers worldwide and, and, and in Europe and, and in US. So treatment must be aggressive. If you have cancer, if you have a bad cancer, you, you would wish to have this cancer being tackled with the most effective therapies, even at the price of an acceptable level or amount of side effects or, 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 or um, decrease in your quality of life, if you believe or if you're sure that down the road, there might be some improvement. So this is clearly what we would recommend. For the other patients, we would now recommend a new standard of care that is initial oral combination. Typically, that would be a combination with a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor, such as Tadalafil or, or, or Sildenafil, and an endothelin receptor antagonist, whichever is the endothelin receptor antagonist you wish to choose, or your physician may wish to choose. So clearly, initial oral combination for many of us is now becoming the new standard of care. This is uh, important, and you have no idea how, how this thought would have been crazy to believe in 1998. In fact, I started my career in pulmonary hypertension in 1998 at the, at the World Symposium on Pulmonary Hypertension in Evian. So at that time, we were not discussing this at all. It's incredible to see the progress that was made and the fact that those treatments were made available. And of course, you, you have to reassess uh, yourself, I mean, you as a patient will be reassessed on a regular basis by your physician to determine whether you've reached certain goals, whether you've improved enough, and if not, you would move on to sequential treatment. Transplantation might be discussed very early on, surely, for the early cases, and then there will be a regular follow-up. This is absolutely important because this disease, as you know, may evolve in a very subtle and, and, and malignant way so that you need to keep the control on a regular basis. We were discussing with Patty just before opening the room uh, on the situation of COVID-19. We do a lot of uh, telehealth now. There the, the are devices or tools to assess patients remotely, uh, to avoid be, being brought to the hospital sometimes. Distance might be a problem. We do value the, the, the role of expert centers. So all this is going to change in the near future. But for now, we need to have those regular reassessment performed uh, at the clinic. Again, um, this is a very dynamic uh, algorithm, and this is how we like to talk to patients, and patients like to hear that from us. So what's on the agenda for the next months, for the next year, for the next years for me, and what are you going to do to help me overcome this disease? So clearly, this is discussed and should be discussed from the very beginning. Now, this is where we are. Uh, the issue is that there have been some frustration 
uh, in the recent past when looking at potential new therapies to help improving outcome and improving quality of life uh, of patients with pH. I just want to show you a couple of slides with recent advances and this one might, might see a little bit complicated. It's just showing the duration of the recent trials that were done, let's say in the past four to five years to bring drugs on the market or to establish the guidelines that I showed you. If you look at the very bottom of the slide here, you will see that the duration of, in terms of weeks has been increased. I mean, it's not doubled, it's sometimes tripled. So it's taking more time um, more numbers of patients, look at the number of patients that had to be included in trial to make, um, um, I mean, to prove that the therapy or strategy was effective, uh, more combination studies, mainly the studies that were done were performed using vasodilators, but perhaps not real disease modifiers in the sense that those drugs we have right now do not necessarily target the cellular changes, the structure of the pulmonary heart uh, arteries. So phase three trials so far have been very long and too long in, um, uh, in a disease area where we, we want to have uh, immediate results. We, we need to get that. This is the, our oath to our, to our patients, which is we want to get you the best treatment possible and we want to get the best drug available uh, rapidly on the market. So duration is a problem. Number of patients is a problem. There's also another um, issue, which is that if you look at the new pathways and options to treat pH, there's no shortage for IDs and targets. And I borrowed this slide from my good friend, Olivier Sidbon, uh, he presented this at, in Nice, and you see mechanism, you see the target, and you see drug names here. I, I don't think it's important to get in details, although I will detail to you a couple of those studies, but clearly the ideas are there, the mechanisms are, are there. The question is how can we um, achieve the, the, the goal to test all of these targets potentially? And the question that is, of course, coming second is do we have uh, enough resources to perform all of those, all these trials, or shouldn't we focus on the ones who are the most likely to work? And I would like to show you a couple of examples of recent trials that were discussed and presented uh, in the past uh, in in the, in the past uh, couple of uh, couple of months. One of the other problems is that there were phase two and three trials in which there was either no benefit or safety issues that were raised. And again, don't look into details in the names, mode of action, et cetera. I would leave the slides available for you if you want to read them back. This has been adapted from, from Olivier's work. One of the problem is that there was a lot of drugs that were tested that didn't hit the market or even were not necessarily published. And we believe as physicians that everything should be transparent and every studies, even if a study is negative, should be available for the public. You need to make yourself uh, aware of the situation. Um, and I think it's also a dedication to patients who have been included in those trials to know where, um, I mean, how the trials ended and how they did. And unfortunately, when we start a clinical trial, we never know if it's going to be uh, a hit. We never know if it's going to work, but at least, the, 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 the oath we make is that we will tell the patient if the study has been positive or negative. As physician, we want these to be published. And you can see here that we have a lot of examples of drugs that were tested, never hit the market. And that's it never hit the market or was not even published. This is, I think, a problem of transparency that we need to tackle. That's our problem as physicians and our partners in industry to get that done properly. Let me talk about three studies that were presented recently, or at least were on which there were some communication. The catalyst study, paradoxalone in patients with pH associated with connective tissue disease, mainly those patients with systemic sclerosis. Unfortunately, the study has been stopped for futility by the uh, steering committee, the data safety monitoring board that judged that the likelihood to have a positive trial was unlikely. So the study was stopped prematurely. So those two programs, Catalyst and Ranger, with this drug, Bardoxolone, which is not a vasodilator. Unfortunately, a vasodilator. Unfortunately this, was, uh, uh, this study was stopped prior to completion. The likelihood to be positive was so low that the, uh, the SMB, the, the safety board, the safety monitoring board decided to interrupt the study. And I think sometimes this is a very difficult de decision that you need to make. 
Second one is Triton. The, the idea of Triton is interesting because it's, it's coming with initial, the idea that the harder you hit at the very beginning of the study, the better the, 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 the diagnosis or the disease, the better is the outcome. In other words, we know that initial double combination works. We didn't know whether initial triple all therapy would work. And that's the idea behind Triton. It was both efficacy and safety. I forget to mention that safety is very important in everything we do. We want drugs that work, but that are, that are also safe. And safety is one of the important issues, surely in the early stage of development of the disease. So Triton, what was that? It was a combination of uh, it was a comparison, sorry, of the combination of macitentin plus tadalafil plus placebo versus macitentin plus tadalafil plus selexipac. So tackling the three major pathways that are known to be important in the management of the disease. So these are the, tri the, 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 the three pillars uh, of, uh, of our knowledge, prostacycline, non receptor antagonists, and nitric oxide pathway uh, in general. So the idea was to say that with triple, we would do better than double. And double was, and that was, uh, um, um, sorry, tested at week 26 with pulmonary vascular resistance measured by rat hat catheterization. So patient had baseline rat hat cath, most of them at time of diagnosis, and then they had a recath that was done after 26 weeks. That was that's pretty much standard of care in in in, in many centers. There might be differences, but it's pretty much standard of care anyway. Um, there was a big disappointment and some hope. Disappointment was that when looking at vascular pulmonary vascular resistance or biomarkers and TPROBNP or exercise capacity, there was no difference between initial triple and initial double. But the good news is that initial double was already very effective to improve pulmonary vascular resistance and TPROBNP and walking distance. So at least we knew and we learned that and we confirmed that initial double uh, a combination therapy with oral drugs works well for patients who are not at high risk of having uh, a, a clinical event. So this is a very important learning. The other learning that is not shown on this slide and that needs to be seen with a little bit of scrutiny is that there might be a benefit on the longer run with triple as opposed to double, but again, the idea of Triton was not to test that hypothesis. So whatever happens after the primary endpoint um, um, in a study that didn't meet its primary endpoint uh, is just interesting for hypothesis generation, not necessarily as a proof of concept. So it, a frustration, triple doesn't work better than double, but double works very well. And we may have benefits down the road with, down the road with, with triple. Pay attention, this is initial triple. We know that initial triple works when sequential. So if you're an initial double and then we wait for a little bit of time or maybe a longer period of time, if we had the third line, it's working. It's improving some of the uh, uh, outcome variables that we like to see um, in, uh, uh, in, in clinical trials. Let's talk about Pulsar. So Tatercept for the treatment of pH and you will hear a lot of this drug. Um, if you look at this cartoon, it's complicated. It gives me the headache. I don't really, I'm, I'm not sure I understand everything what's on it. I'm just a, a simple cardiologist. What I can tell you about Sotaracet, it's that it's not a vasodilator. It's acting on somewhere else. It has the potential to change the structure of the pulmonary artery. So we have here a compound that is given subcutaneously that has the potential to really change the shape, to really change the function of the pulmonary, uh, of the pulmonary arteries. And this is a, a, a drug that has, I mean, there, there's no other drug like that uh, around at, at, at this moment. The study design, just to make, to cut a long story short, there was a comparison of two doses of this uh, compound that is given subcutaneously every three weeks versus no drug placebo. And what was interesting is that there was a long-term observational period, which um, in fact, 
um, makes a lot of sense for a drug that is not expected to work immediately. It's expected to work after days, weeks, and perhaps months. And what was seen as in terms of primary endpoint that was changing pulmonary vascular resistance is that it was working. It was working not only at the highest dose, but also across the spectrum of disease with a unique patient profile. All the patients were uh, on combination therapy. There was only 9% of patients were on monotherapy. More than half were on triple and close to 40% were on parenteral prostacyclines. Those patients were typically excluded from clinical trials. So even in these situations where the disease starts to be complex to treat, the drug has been effective to improve a variety of clinical endpoints that we like to see, biomarkers, PVR, walking distance, et cetera. So important, and believe me, I've been in, you don't have to believe me, but I can testify that being in this field for more than 20 years, it's the first time we see something that is as spectacular as the results we, we, we got with Sotartaset. It, it looks like back when we had nothing and we were using intravenous prostacycline. This is what, this is clearly what it is. It, it needs to be confirmed in a phase three trial, of course, but at least this phase two is very impressive. Couple of two, I think two slides to know how to address the challenge and then uh, it will be time for me to conclude. This is, this is something you do when you want to demonstrate that an intervention for any disease um, really works. If you start from the bottom to the top, you start with some preclinical work and then you come to human and clinical. Human means normal individuals and clinical means proof, proof that your intervention is working. The level of evidence is the highest when you demonstrate in a clinical trial that an intervention is working. It's called a proof of concept, uh, even that's phase two and that's phase three, you demonstrating your, that your intervention works. What is under, this is the, the tip of the iceberg. What's under the water is all the background, all the theory behind it. And we would never take as a proof a drug that would work in a in vitro cell model of pulmonary hypertension. We need to demonstrate that it's working on patient. This is absolutely mandatory. And of course, each of these five steps that are shown here are important hurdle to pass. Each hurdle takes months, sometimes years, before getting a, a, an effective drug on the market that would be implemented in the, in, in the, in the, in the treatment algorithm. So this is a very important challenge we, we, we have to pass. Also, the fact that everything that starts in the lab, in the bench, doesn't really necessarily happen in the, at the bedside. There's a lot of, there's a disconnect between what we do in the lab and what we see in the, uh, happening in, in, in the real life. Um, I wanted to put that forward to you. We, we use that inverse pyramid to look at what we believe to be, uh, to be important. But when we talk to patients, it has nothing to do with what we expect as physicians. What you as patients uh, are asking us is to get an improvement in symptoms, to get a better in the exercise tolerance, to get a better quality of life, spend time with your family, go to work, um, um, uh, uh, travel or, or run a, a normal life or something that would be close to a normal life. Then, of course, hospitalization visits to the clinic. This is important. You want that to decrease. You want to optimal expert care. You probably care less about mortality clinical trials or whatever we want as physicians. And I think this is something that I personally learned about, over the years is that our focus now is getting more to what the patient wants, and we call that patient-related outcomes. So what you as patients would feel is important to us and should be brought in the equation for clinical trials. And the next clinical trials may address different challenges, maybe not modifying the disease, but uh, just how to live better with the disease and having add-ons that can be taken when you go on shopping, when you go on doing some exercise or whatever, this is something we need to take into account uh, in the future. So conclusion, we've, we have achieved a lot, really. PH is, is one of the few, if not the only one, uh, rare disease for which effective treatment options are available. 
Where we are is that we're still missing a cure for pH. Many recent trials didn't reach their primary endpoint, raised concern, and there's a lot of work that is done now in the background, as you can imagine, to define where we go. Future challenges means that we need to better understand the disease. We need to better find disease-modifying target, targets. We need to find um, new randomized control trials. We need to consider global impact of healthcare on research current COVID crisis is one of the big, very big example. And also listen to what the patients are saying to us. And I would like to leave you with this last picture. These are the three pillars, the three towers of knowledge, endothelial receptor antagonists, nitric oxide, PD-5 inhibitors, prostacyclines, perhaps in the future, so that is it. And for those who are, are fans of the series, this is a picture that was taken at the fort of its own beach, it's Dragonstone in Game of Thrones. And there's a little quote down there by Bob Dylan saying that the times are changing and this is what we hope for the future of pulmonary hypertension. And thank you very much. Amazing. That's such a great talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, oh my goodness. All right. So for everybody who's participating in the audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the Q&A box. Uh, we have this open for questions. Anything, uh, any research pH related questions, please throw them in um, and let us know. Not the chat box, but the Q&A box. Um, uh, uh, we first have a, 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 a statement from Carl Hicks. He says, many, many thanks, Dr. Vashiri. Um, time now for a shimei. Oh. <laughs> thanks again for all you do in this fight against pH. Thank you. This is very, thank you for both comments, actually. I, I appreciate both. Uh, a little bit better what we do, but the shimei is, I, I think it's, it's, it's a hit. Yeah. Yeah. And Kathleen also says, thank you so much, Kathleen Richardson, one of our team members. I have a question for you, a basic question. Um, and wow, you really, in a half hour, I just have to say, I don't think I've seen a talk quite so succinctly talk about, you know, the spectrum of where we are and where we're headed in, in research. It was amazing. Um, thank you. On average, how long does it take to go from an idea to a, it provided that it works through all the studies, an idea to drug on the market. Uh, thanks, Patty. This is this is a great question. If I'm if I'm looking at, I mean, things have changed a little bit uh, from what we used to have in the past, but it's taking five to ten years, uh, roughly, because once you start to find a, a mechanism uh, at the bedside, you need to bring it forward to to uh, uh, clinical development, find the drug candidate. It's five to ten years to get to to get on the market. Sometimes longer than that. What is interesting in pH and I haven't talked about is what we call, we call drug repurposing, which is taking a drug that has been used in one disease area that shares some mechanism with pH and take that drug and test it in pH. And this, this probably is a shorter span. There's a lot of example. I mean, clearly Sotartacep is an example. Imatinib that's used in cancer is another good example of drug that has been repurposed. Even the prostacyclines, initially they were used for um, as anticoagulants or um, uh, as flushing for patients with uh, in in uh, in uh, in hemodialysis who could not tolerate heparin flush. So this the repurposing is something that I haven't talked about, but is also important in 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 the development. Great. All right. So here's a couple of questions in the box. You mentioned imatinib, so I'm going to go on that one first. It was shown to have positive benefits, but had safety issues, and so ultimately mm -hmm. it was not approved in PAH. Do you know of any similar drugs being considered that target similar pathways to imatinib? Yes, they are. Uh, they, they are. They currently are. Uh, um, one drug that is uh, taken by uh, inhalation, this, the, the company that develops it is called Gosamer Bio. Uh, there are other compounds that are um, uh, tested currently or, or could be tested in the future. There's something weird about the imatinib and the tyrosine kinase pathway is that it's a sort of yin-yang effect or Januskopf effect. Um, it's where some of them are working and some of them may cause pulmonary hypertension. Yeah. That's the story around the zetinib, right? So um, when you go in the mechanism of those diseases, you need to, to have uh, enough safety background to tell you that those drugs can be tested in humans. And uh, yes, there are, I, I think, the, the, and this is all about repurposing, right? The, the, this pathway is not completely abandoned. We just need to get 
um, more attention perhaps to the safety profile of these drugs, test them uh, maybe with different route of administration. So inhaled might be something we may, uh, we may get interest with. Mm -hmm. What um, Back to the Cetatorcept and uh, Pulsar study, were there any tolerability concerns with that agent? Very, actually, very few. There was, uh, and I recall when, when um, um, in the, the initial discussion, including the ones we had with uh, with my my institution review board for approval of the uh, of the studies, um, this drug is known to increase hemoglobin, and is known to um, increase systemic blood pressure. And that was, of course, it's a concern. It's obviously a concern even in pH. The the side effects were actually those side effects were were amazingly unusual, uh, if inexistent and not different from the placebo. Um, the injection side also has been a matter of concern, whether the patient could tolerate subcut injection. I mean, if you're on subcut treprostinil, this is going to be very much easy going to get a, a, a regular shot of sotatrocept. So very few safety concerns. We need to be uh, aware of the fact that um, what happens in the phase two, which was the case in Pulsar, must translate in the phase three. In the phase three trial, we will have a larger number of patients being exposed to the drug, and we will be able to answer much better the potential concerns that we uh, uh, um, that that may arise from 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 the study itself. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, okay, here's a really good conceptual question: Why do you think clinical trials and studies fail? Is it poor design? Is it not enough baseline work on the mechanism of action and the impact of the disease? Is it the wrong endpoint? So, I mean, have all failures been true failures or is it due to study design and we're not seeing it? Thank you, Gareth, for asking that question. I know it's you asking this, you're online. That's great. I don't see you, but, but, but I'm, I, I just want to say hi. Um, it's a little bit of everything. Um, and I, I think that the, the, the tough job we have right now is that we are exploring uh, pathways that we have never tested before. And we test them on top of something that already works very well. Um, so I, I think that the problem is a one, the, the, the population of patients. If, if I have, and I'm following patients um, that were treated back in the years 2000, were still on monotherapy with one oral drug, and they're doing extremely well. Those patients are unlikely to improve to any other intervention. At the same time, we were wondering whether those patients were at the, the other end of the spectrum, the ones were stable on prostacyclines would benefit from an intervention. And Pulsar told us that it was, it's truly the case. So I think it's a matter of uh, population that is chosen. Um, the design itself goes with the primary endpoint. If you're choosing the, I think six minute walking distance for a phase two trial is, is is, is really tough. It's really complicated. Uh, PVR remains something very powerful. Perhaps that we should look at risk profile in the future, uh, in future studies. There are biomarkers that are underexplored. And the day we will get the biomarker for the pulmonary circulation, which BNP is surely not, that day we might have a surrogate marker that we could use as a proof of concept to demonstrate to demonstrate efficacy. Then the third problem is that um, uh, in terms of, uh, of data that you record and that you collect, the difficulty is to cope with the globalization of pulmonary hypertension. What I want for, for any patients across the globe is that that patient would receive the same treatment in Denver, in Brussels, in London, uh, in Rome, or, or wherever. We know it's not the case. And we know that in some countries, the standard of care or the access to drug, to drug is a problem. And I think this is something that plays in some way against us uh, in, in, in oh. treatment development. If you look at the, the trial centers today uh, for phase two of phase three, it's amazing how it changed. In the past, it was good old Europe, uh, US, North America in general, and that's it. Now you have patients coming from Thailand, Vietnam, uh, South Korea, Romania, Poland, I mean, uh, um, Argentina from all across the globe. W what we need to do, and we're getting there with 
uh, educational programs such as this one is to bring the knowledge gap, gap to another level so that physicians first, but then patients get access to the best programs possible. And I think this is, some, this is something we probably we, we need to do, uh, uh, for, to do in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in the future. And that's probably also why we were getting in so much trouble to get phase twos. Uh, um, uh, and of course, the target you use must be really something that will modify the disease much more than what we have now. One question that often comes up um, from folks is, do you know anything about clinical trials in stem cell therapy in pH? Yeah. Um, yes, so it's been, it's been in the air for 20 years. Um, it was already discussed in Evian uh, in 1998. Um, I think that everybody's struggling with that. There, there were programs that were launched, some of them uh, in, in Canada, our colleagues in Canada were very well advanced, they were the first ones to do stem cell therapy. Um, it hasn't surfaced as being something as uh, efficacious as we believed. And if I, if I dare to make a parallel with uh, cardiac disorders and especially left heart disease and, and, and uh, left heart failure, which is something I, I, I take care of a lot in, in, in my practice, um, there have been trials there for uh, decades. And unfortunately, none of the trials were uh, uh, reached the, the proof of efficacy beyond the proof of concept. None of them really worked. So... I think cell therapy might be one of the things we need to look at. Um, it's been there for a while with not much results. Genetic modifications as well, something gene therapy, something that is interesting. I, I don't think it's ready for prime time. I don't think I will see that uh, before retirement or even be, before I pass. I hope I will, but I'm not sure about that. So it's not, not there yet, but it, it, it will happen sometime. Great. great. So let's see, are there any other questions um, from our audience? If you guys have any other questions in the next couple of minutes, please feel free to throw in the question and answer uh, box. These have been great. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's this last year, it, it was super exciting, the clinical trials that have been presented so far. Yeah. I have a question maybe you could explain to the audience. We talk about, um, we talk about you know, presenting the data can you explain just in broad strokes what then happens? So like we've had the top level results, but then it's gonna be published in a peer reviewed journal. So what's the process for it getting from, we're all excited about Pulsar to like, we believe in Pulsar and we do the phase three trial. Like how does that work? Yeah, so so this is, this is a very important question. Um, these are two different processes. One is, the process of getting a phase two right. And, and I forgot to, to answer the fact that there were studies that, was brought, brought, that were brought to, sorry, drugs that were brought from phase two to phase three straight on with negative phase twos. And this is a huge mistake. Nobody should replicate that at all. So th this is something that shouldn't be, that should never be rep replicated. So the process are going in parallel. Um, you have the peer review process that starts with presentation at uh, major clinical um, at major conferences, and in parallel, the publication process goes on. Um, if you are as a, a, a clinician getting and having an access to the data before that publication, have the ability to get through all the details. If you really believe that there's something strong with a disease, uh, with, a, with, a, with a compound, sorry, not with a disease, with a drug, then you can move on to phase three before the publication of the phase two. I mean, because this is taking, it's taking a year to elaborate to phase three. If you take into account the amendments, this and that, it may take up to a year to get, to get a, a study up and running. You have a window of opportunity that is quite narrow. So you need to work work in parallel. So you need to tackle, finish the phase two, get the publication right, at the same time, get the phase three right, recruit your center, set up the protocol, and then launch the project. And typically when a phase three study is launched, the phase two publication is out. That's how it works. But all these things take, take, take a hell out of time. Um, you never know uh, when you, you know that, Patty, when you, when you send a, 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 uh, an article to a journal, 
You never know what is going to come. It's like the box of chocolate in Forrest Gump. You yeah. open it, you know, never know what's going to come first. So. There's David. All right, Gareth has another question. Who's the best rugby team? Oh, France, of course. No question about that. <laughs> nice. All right. So um, with that, uh, I um, just want to say a few things at the, at the finish. Um, first off, thank you again, Jean-Luc. This was yeah, just amazing. Um, and this, uh, this session will be recorded. So if you were able to see it, but your family member, your friend didn't see it, and you want to share it, we're going to get this recorded and put onto social media so that you can share this really nice, high quality presentation with your friends and families. Um, we want to also thank our sponsors of the Tour of Phenomenal Hope. So this presentation has been part of our month-long stage race, as it will, called the Tour of Phenomenal Hope. And our sponsors include Janssen, Acceleron, Bayer as platinum sponsors, United Therapeutics, and CVS Specialty as gold sponsors, and Altavant as our silver sponsor. So we're very, uh, we're, we're super thankful for all of the support. There's still a half a month left in uh, November PH Awareness Month. So if you want to learn more about Team Phenomenal Hope, what's going on, What's our next event, which by the way, will be a Twitter chat next Tuesday evening. Um, so you can meet us on the Twitter and we'll do a lot of questions and answers, uh, mainly me asking questions of members in the community, um, sort of uh, focusing on the talk from last week about uh, being an empowered person living with PH. Um, that'll be next Tuesday. If you want to find out what more is happening, go to teamphenomenalhope.org. You can still get involved and be a part of our competitions. And of course, if you like what you heard today and you want to help support our work, including our research fund, uh, please donate and share our donation link with your friends and family to support our ongoing work. You can make a donation today at teamph.org slash donate. So with that, thank you again. Uh, I certainly enjoyed this and um, Look forward to seeing you on the Twitter and hopefully someday at conferences again. So, uh -huh. all right. Thank you very much, Patty. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye, take care.